Hello everyone, my name is Imogen Gibbon and I'm Deputy Director and Chief Curator of Portraiture at the National Galleries of Scotland. I'm delighted to be joining you this evening as part of Art Unlocked, the new online talk series developed by Art UK in collaboration with Bloomberg Philanthropies. And my thanks to both organisations for the opportunity to take you through a selection of portraits from the National Galleries of Scotland collection. The National Galleries of Scotland is home to one of the world's finest collections of international and Scottish art, which ranges from the Middle Ages to the present day. We also hold a world-renowned collection of Scottish and international photography, a modern and contemporary art archive, which also includes an artist book collection. Our galleries in Edinburgh are the Scottish National Gallery, the Scottish National Portrait Gallery and the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art. I've selected a number of portraits for this evening's talk which are part of the displays at the Scottish National Portrait Gallery. And I must admit, admit at the outset, I couldn't resist including a number of my own favourite works, works which continue to draw me back again and again, and which have been much missed during recent sporadic access to the gallery. To set the scene, I'm going to introduce the beautiful building, which is the Scottish National Portrait Gallery. The gallery was founded in 1882 and opened to the public in 1889 as the world's first purpose-built portrait gallery. It was described in its opening year as an interest in Scotland as it was, as it is and as it is to be. The architect of the building was Sir Robert Rowan Anderson, who had previously worked with the Gothic revivalist architect George Gilbert Scott in London. The gallery is built from red sandstone in the style of a Gothic palace. In Rowan Anderson's own words, I've adopted the secular architecture of the latter half of the 13th century. The building was part funded by the government body, the Board of Manufacturers, who were responsible for the decorative arts and the encouragement of education in the fine arts in Scotland. However, the largest amount of funding came from John Ritchie Finlay, the proprietor of the Scotsman newspaper, who was known right up until the formal opening of the gallery in 1889 as the anonymous donor. The building includes a breathtaking decorative scheme, both inside and out. Outside, a series of sculptures of figures from Scottish history, together with decorative carvings and allegorical scenes in relief, adorn the facade and the east end of the building. In these two exterior images, the photograph shows some sculptures still to be installed, and the drawing on the top right-hand side shows those installed on the northwest tower. And here is John Ritchie Finlay on the left, um, the anonymous donor in a portrait painted by Sir George Reed in 1899. When the gallery opened, it shared the building with the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland and their collection, the Museum of Antiquities. This was the case up until the recent refurbishment of the gallery. Now restored to its original splendour and internal arrangement is a Victorian picture gallery a suite of 10 top -lit, lit galleries on the second floor now house the permanent collection displays from the 16th century up until the early 20th century. The modern and contemporary portraiture collection is on display on the first floor, which also houses a dedicated display space for photographs, the Robert Maplethorpe Photography Gallery. There is no doubt that you're walking into a building which is dedicated to Scottish history as the inscription on the facade of the building details illustrated here on the left. In the joined up image of the building's entrance on the right, made up of a late 19th century photograph and a recent recreation, the statues are clockwise from top left, Malcolm II, King of Scots, Queen Margaret, Robert the Bruce and William Wallace. Just visible at the apex of the entrance in the combined image are the allegorical figures of history, the earlier figure was replaced due to weathering in 2013 with a new figure by the sculptor Alexander Stoddart. Inside in the Great Hall is a processional frieze by William Hole of 156 figures from Scottish history, figures thought at the end of the 19th century to have determined the course of Scotland's history. And on the right, you can see Hole on the scaffolding painting the frieze. The procession moves backwards in time from Thomas Carlyle to Stone Age Man. Carlyle's view of history is made up of the biographies of great men is, of course, in evidence. Very few female figures appear in the frieze. A mural cycle, also by Hole, depicting scenes from early Scottish history, occupies the first floor ambulatory of the Great Hall, 
all of which is topped by a zodiacal ceiling above and surrounded by painted heraldry and stained glass. Hole made drawings for the frieze. Here you can see the north side featuring Caledonia, a personification of Scotland, with the part studied by Hole. The figures in the procession are walking towards Caledonia, who holds a book containing the story of Scotland and draws back a curtain to reveal a starry sky, a cue to look up to the zodiacal ceiling above. Designed as a Scottish National Portrait Gallery in miniature, the frieze was painted against a richly gilded background suggestive of mosaic, with the cast of characters providing an encyclopedia of Scottish costume. Although populated by keen antiquarian knowledge, Pole also employed some artistic license. And to give the full effect, as if we're all standing together in the portrait gallery in the Great Hall, this is a photograph taken from the centre of the space and gives a sense of the decorative scheme looking up to the zodiacal ceiling. The first curator of the gallery in 1884 was John Miller Gray, a former Bank of Scotland clerk and antiquarian art critic and journalist. The first photograph shows Gray when he was working for the Bank of Scotland. The middle image shows him one year into his role as curator. And the third image shows him in the 1890s after around 10 years as curator of the gallery. Gray died at the age of 43 in 1894. His will stipulated that the annual interest from the residue of his estate was to be used for the purchase of portraits of eminent deceased men and women born in Scotland to be hung in the Scottish National Portrait Gallery. No engravings, portraits must be from life. Although the question of acquiring portraits of the living was discussed from the very earliest days, it wasn't until 1982 that the first portrait of a living person was acquired. This portrait of the Queen Mother, commissioned by the gallery by the artist Avigdor Arica, and the commissioning strand of acquisitions continues today. And now we're going to move on to some of the portraits which adorn the walls. This is Esther Ingalls, who is a Jacobean Franco-Scottish embroiderer, calligrapher and miniature painter, who was born in 1569 and died in 1624. The portrait was painted by an unidentified artist in oil on oak panel in 1595 and measures around 75 by just over 60 centimetres. It provides an insight into the type of cultural activity going on in Edinburgh in the late 16th century. And it's a unique example in the early modern portraiture collection of a non-aristocratic artisan female sitter. I mentioned in my introduction that the Portrait Gallery formerly shared the building with the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. This painting was previously in the Society's collection, bequeathed to them by the antiquarian David Lang, who was also a collector of illuminated manuscripts produced by Ingalls. It was on long loan to the gallery from the 1880s until it was gifted by the Society to the National Galleries of Scotland in 2009. Ingalls had come to London as an infant with her Huguenot parents who had fled religious persecution from Dieppe in France. She settled in Edinburgh with her family around the age of three or four in around 1574. Her mother was a handwriting teacher from whom Ingalls learnt her art and her father became master of the French school in the city. Ingalls is the Scottish form of her original surname Longlois. It was in Edinburgh around 1596 that she married the government official Bartholomew Kello. This portrait was painted around the time of their marriage and depicts Ingalls at around 25 years old. You can make out the inscription Anno Domini 1595 along the top edge of the painting. Ingalls produced exquisitely illuminate, illuminated documents and small books, concentrating mostly on biblical or devotional texts, illustrated with flowers and often tiny self-portraits which promoted her authorship and talent. These are believed to be the earliest known self-portraits by a woman artist in Britain and she's detailed as only one of three professional women artists practicing in Scotland before 1700. Her patrons were members of the Stuart and Tudor courts, and there are 59 known manuscript books produced by Ingalls between 1586 and 1624. During her career as a scribe and bookmaker, she created at least 19 self-portraits, constructing these by imitating and adapting previous portrait conventions. In some of these self-portraits, she appears as she does here in this portrait on the left, 
The self-portrait of Ingalls on the right is from her illuminated manuscript, Argumenta Samorum, which she produced in London in 1606 and dedicated to Henry Frederick, Prince of Wales, and which is now in the collection of Harvard Library. In the corner of the portrait gallery's picture on the left, the honeysuckle and pink carnation knotted together symbolize fertility, fidelity and love, and are most probably a reference to the flowers she employed in her illustrated texts and potentially suggests that she may have been involved in the composition of this portrait. She wears a striped black bodice, a fashionable full figure of eight ruff, and a tall black brimmed hat on top of her swept back hair. Her stomacher, the V-shaped decorative cloth over her chest and stomach, is embellished with floral black work, a form of embroidery which used black thread. Her necklace is composed of several strands of tiny beads, and on her left hand, she has three rings, one with an amber-coloured stone in a conventional quatrefoil bezel. On her small finger is a plain double hoop and her thumb has another double hoop. And this might have been her wedding ring, which was often worn at the time by women on the thumb. And the little manuscript book she's holding alludes to her profession, although admittedly is slightly larger than the smallest book she produced, which was amazingly around one and a half by two inches in size. Ingalls and Kello appear to have moved to London by 1604, and they were recorded as living in Essex from 1607 to 1614. By 1615, they'd returned to Edinburgh, where Ingalls died aged 53 in 1624. She was survived by her husband and four children. Now, moving into the early 19th century, on the left is a portrait of John Sakehouse, a young Inuk man from southwest Greenland whose name in his homeland was Hans Zacius. Zacius was born sometime between 1792 and 1797. This portrait of him on the left is by the Scottish landscape painter and portraitist Alexander Naismith. The most renowned painting by Naismith is his 1787 portrait of Robert Burns, which you can see here on the right. The portrait of Burns was commissioned by the poet's publisher, William Creech, to be engraved for a new edition of the poet's poems. Creech apparently warned Naismith in advance of the portrait sitting that Burns was nervous of having his portrait painted and that it, would be, that it would be an idea for Naismith to put his sitter at ease. So Naismith, on greeting Burns, reportedly told him that he was to relax while he spent some time finishing off what was on his easel and then he would be ready to begin. Burns is said to have talked away, never dreaming that the painter was rapidly transforming his animated face to the canvas. So back to the portrait of Zacchaeus. Um, this was painted by Naismith around 30 years later in about 1818. It's a small portrait measuring unframed about 30 by 22 centimetres and probably documents the first time an Inuk freely travelled to Scotland. The most common extant story is that Zacchaeus became curious to visit Britain after missionaries converted him to Christianity. He stowed away with his kayak on the whaling ship Thomas and Anne, arriving at the ship's home port of Leith, then just outside of Edinburgh, in August 1816. Huge crowds soon came to marvel at his kayaking and harpoon throwing, and he became something of a local celebrity. It was reported in a Scots magazine that he can, with the greatest indifference, strike a ship biscuit floating in the water and split it at the distance of 30 yards. He became a familiar figure in Leith and Edinburgh as a result of these exhibitions of skill and was reported to have occupied the rest of his time by carving wooden kayak models, improving his English, playing the flute, dancing and meeting new friends. The ship Thomas and Anne returned to Greenland in 1817 with Zacchaeus on board. Finding his sister, his only surviving relative, had died, he soon returned to Leith. The hunting society in which Zacchaeus grew up was characterised by a strong tra tradition of storytelling, and one can only imagine that his tales from his time spent in Leith and Edinburgh may well have been woven into this tradition if he had stayed in his homeland. Naismith came across him during this second stay in Leith from 1817 to 1818, He's depicted Zacchaeus dressed in thick oilskins and holding a harpoon. And you can certainly sense the harpoon and line are held tightly, but ready to be unleashed at a moment's notice. Fond of drawing, <clears throat> Zacchaeus was befriended by Naismith, 
who welcomed him into his family and gave him art lessons at his home in Edinburgh. Naismith was instrumental in Zacius joining the Arctic explorer, Captain John Ross, on his expedition in search of the Northwest Passage in 1818 and 1819. Zacius acted as a paid interpreter and also as a negotiator and artist. One of his drawings depicts the meeting of Ross's crew with a group of Inuit living in Northwest Greenland and a reproduction in form of a colored engraving was published in Ross's account of the voyage. On his return, Zacius was much fated and visited London before returning to Leith where he fell ill with typhus and died only a few months later in 1819. His funeral was attended by many of those who had encountered him during his stay in Scotland. In addition to Naismith's portrait, a number of prints depicting Zacius were made. The inscription on this print, after a painting by amateur Edinburgh artist Amelia Anderson, details that on one occasion of Zacius's skill and agility exhibitions in Leith Harbour, it attracted the greatest concourse of spectators ever known to have assembled at Leith. And apparently the crowds were so great that some of the spectators were actually pushed over into the harbour and, re and required rescuing by boat. So saying goodbye to Hans Zacius and leaping a couple of centuries forward into the 1920s, here's a portrait of topically the Olympic athlete and missionary Eric Liddell. Liddell famously didn't run in his favoured event, the 100 metres at the Paris Olympics in 1924 as the heats were on a Sunday, although he went on to win the gold medal in the 400 metres, as depicted in the 1981 Academy Award winning film Chariots of Fire. The portrait is by Eileen Soper, who was born in 1905 and died in 1990, and this is the only existing painted portrait of Liddell. Soper aged only 20 when she painted this portrait and already a well-known illustrator and printmaker, depicts Liddell not as an athlete or rugby player, he won seven caps for Scotland in the early 1920s, but suited, not altogether as serious as a boardroom portrait, but with a hint of a smile around the mouth and eyes, looking up from a letter as if in contemplation. The portrait was painted in 1925, a year after his triumph in the 400 metres. 1925 was also the year of Liddell's last appearance on the athletics track on British soil at Hampden Park in the summer of 1925. And later in the year, he traveled to China to pursue missionary work. Soper was born in Enfield, Middlesex, and moved to Hertfordshire, where her artist father, George, created a wildlife sanctuary in their garden. Soper sketched many of the animals living there and made etchings and engravings from an early age. She first exhibited her etchings in 1921 at the Royal Academy of Arts in London and the Printmaker Society of California, and attracted much attention from critics, fellow artists, and the public. She, she went on to write several books for children, produced a series of natural history books and was a founder member of the Society of Wildlife Artists. Artists, But she is perhaps best known today as an illustrator for Edith Blyton. Blyton wrote to Soper to let her know, you will be interested to know that my fans never mention any artist but you. They seem to recognize your pictures, but nobody else's. You can see Soper's illustrative style in this pencil sketch on the right for the portrait of Liddell, also in the collection of the National Galleries of Scotland. The final portrait is loosely painted and depicts the sitter with a more relaxed attitude than he has in the preparatory sketches, but with no less of an acute direct gaze straight out of the picture. For me, these depictions of Liddell radiate as a result of having read about the story of the relationship between artist and sitter in the excellent biography of Liddell by Duncan Hamilton. Soper was a family friend of the Liddells. During the time he sat for this portrait, they took walks together in the countryside. Soper wrote a poem inscribed to E.L. describing how they walked in the hills and how he etched their initials in a tree trunk with a silver key. The poem contains the line, you wrote that time might spell the letters E and L. Any thoughts of romance between the two were ended when Liddell left for China later that year. And Soper kept this portrait on an easel in her sitting room for more than 60 years, never exhibiting it. The painting was found on her easel when she died in 1990. Their names forever linked in Soper's inscription at the bottom left hand of the portrait. 
where they appear complete with middle initials for Eileen, Alice Soper and Eric Henry Liddell. In the National Galleries of Scotland 1995 Spring Newsletter, there was a small report about individuals not represented by a portrait in the collection, and Eric Liddell was one of those individuals mentioned. A newsletter subscriber remembered reading this when she came upon this portrait of Liddell for sale in London in 1995 at the Chris Beatles Gallery, which looks after the estate and copyright of Eileen Soper. She contacted us and the portrait was born by, bought by the National Galleries of Scotland, I quote, with alacrity. A thank you letter to the eagle-eyed spotter was duly sent, which included the words, we had despaired of ever getting a likeness of Eric Liddell, so there is much rejoicing here. Now moving on into the 21st century, Scottish artist Ken Curry has captured the horror and anxiety associated with cancer in this powerful triple portrait, Three Oncologists, commissioned by the National Galleries of Scotland and painted in 2002. The painting is just over two metres high and two and a half metres wide. Curry studied at the Glasgow School of Art and used industrial Glasgow as the subject of his early work. From the mid 1990s, he focused on individuals instead of crowd scenes and painted in haunting luminous colours. Three Oncologists was Curry's first official portrait commission, although he has acknowledged that much of his work is about indirect portraiture. When the portrait was painted, Professor Robert Steele on the left, Professor Sir Alfred Kushiri in the centre, and Professor Sir David Lane on the right, were members of the Department of Surgery and Molecular Oncology at Ninewells Hospital and Medical School in Dundee. As pioneering cancer spe specialists, the oncologists are depicted in the very act of their work to destroy the disease. And the first time Curry actually met his sitters was actually the first time the three men had all been together in the same room, despite working in the same hospital due to their different specialisms. In a conversation with the artist, Sir David Lane remarked that in his experience, people see cancer as a form of darkness from which it is an oncologist's job to retrieve people. For Curry, this was the key to unlocking how he was going to envision this group portrait. As the viewers, we feel we have momentarily interrupted the oncologists in their, in their work. The curtain is partially drawn, alluding to an operating theatre beyond, with only these three individuals who know what is going on in the complete darkness in front of us. I say momentarily, but many visitors spend a long time in front of this painting, and since its acquisition almost 20 years ago, it's become one of the most talked about and remembered works in the collection. Upon its unveiling in 2002, it was hailed by an art critic as a landmark artwork, recalling the great Dutch medical group portraits of the past, and a picture that is not only of its time, but that will, will endure for a very long time to come. Curry has commented on the intensive nature of realising this work. In his own words, for me, it's more than a portrait. It's about my experience of meeting these three people and what I think about them. And it's come from the filter of my own experience and my own memory. Professor Steele has remarked that the portrait captures the seriousness of purpose of what we do and something about the unknown quantity of what we do. He adds, at the end of the day, we're dealing with a disease we don't fully understand. And I think the painting captures that very well. Curry spent many hours observing his sitters in the operating theater and consulting rooms. This interaction with his subjects has enabled him to communicate an understanding of the nature and purpose of their work. As the oncologists were unable to gather for multiple portrait sittings, life masks were made as a record of their appearance, and you can see them on the screen now. These are required for the collection and are often on display alongside the portrait. On the day the life masks were made, Professor Steele on the left had to endure cling film covering the area around his mouth as he'd not shaved that day and the wet plaster needed a smooth surface to adhere to. Curry hung the masks up in his Glasgow studio as part of the process to work out the composition and lighting for the portrait. Curry's spoken about how paintings should haunt you, having been haunted himself by paintings which he has gone back to to look at again and again to find the mystery deepens rather than is solved. A characteristic which he recognises as the mark of a great work of art. And I think this statement truly encapsulates the painting Three Oncologists for the many people who have spent time in front of it 
and go on to remember the painting once their visit to the gallery is over. On to the next artwork. This highly unusual portrait sculpture is a recreation in crystal glass of one of the racing helmets worn by Susie Wolfe during her career in Formula One. Wolfe was born in Oban on the west coast of Scotland in 1982 and from a young age raced karts, winning many awards in the sport. Following a 10 year career in professional motor racing, she moved into F1 in 2012 as a team development driver for Williams before being promoted to test driver. At the 2014 British Grand Prix, she became the first woman in 22 years to take part in an F1 race weekend. She retired from motorsport driving in 2015 and co-founded Dare to be Different, an initiative that helps to inspire and develop women who work in or want to work in the motorsport arena. The artist Angela Palmer is a graduate of the Royal College of Art and the Ruskin School of Drawing and Fine Art. Her sculptures are in museum collections around the world and Palmer's fascinated by the complex forms and her interests range from human anatomy to engineering. She's explored different materials and craftsmanship to map and represent character and structure. And her recent work has responded to the forms found within engines, in particular in Formula One. On meeting Susie Wolfe, she said that she was immediately struck by the strength of her character and her routine acceptance of the risks as a Formula One test driver. She was as gifted and fearless as her male counterparts. Her goal was not to be the best female driver in the world, but to be the best driver in the world. This was a difficult proposition for many observers who struggled to overcome their prejudice in this male dominated environment. Interestingly, Wolf's helmet played a significant role in bestowing her equal status as a driver. Once her helmet was on, no one knew if she was male or female. And to create this portrait, Palmer worked with a team of glass blowers in Stourbridge near Birmingham, a town renowned for its glass industry. Palmer took them the helmet that Wolf had worn in her final F1 race. A 20 kilo brass cast was created from the helmet, which had molten lead crystal glass at a temperature of 1,400 degrees centigrade, mouth blown into the mold, forcing the crystal into every detailed crevice, resulting in this hollow crystal glass helmet. Palmer has commented that when she first saw the final spectacular form of the helmet, that it was redolent with the membrane of the skull. F1 race helmets are tailor-made to exacting design specifications to provide the maximum physical protection for individual drivers, a fact which Palmer took into account as part of the idea to create a portrait sculpture of Wolf in the form of a helmet and not just any one of her helmets, but the very last helmet she used in her professional motor racing career. Palmer has described the sculpture as a very intimate portrait in a way of Susie Wolfe. It could not belong to anyone else. And the result is a delicate object, the frag fragility of which reminds us of the vulnerability and bravery of, dri of drivers like Wolfe, <clears throat> as they take extraordinary risks in pursuit of ever faster speeds. <clears throat> And to this evening's final artwork, <clears throat> excuse me, a dazzling, dazzling, dazzlingly vibrant and compelling portrait of Horse MacDonald by the artist Roxana Halls, painted in 2019. Horse is an iconic and unique singer-songwriter and one of Scotland's most celebrated singers. She has been writing, recording and performing for over 30 years and Q magazine described her as owning one of the finest voices of modern times soul and intelligence combined. She's opened for and toured with international artists, including Tina Turner, B.B. King, Brian Ferry and Bert Bacharach. And her critically acclaimed one woman autobiographical play, Careful, first performed in 2016, details stories from her life, including growing up gay in Lanark in the 1970s. In 2017, Horse was one of the inductees into the Saltire Society Outstanding Women of Scotland community. And in 2018, she was awarded the Diva Magazine Hall of Fame Award in recognition of her life and work. Last year marked the 30th anniversary of her first album, The Same Sky. So it was fitting for the National Galleries of Scotland to unveil this portrait in December 2020, although it still feels like a very new acquisition as the portrait initially was only on display for a handful of days before the December lockdown. Award-winning artist Roxana Halls is drawn to investigate the meaning of cultural trends 
and invites the viewer to reflect on the interplay of gender, class, sexuality and identity. Her many solo exhibitions include Roxana Hall's Tingle Tangle at the National Theatre, South Bank, London, and she's been a multiple exhibitor in the BP Portrait Award, the Royal Society of Portrait Painters Annual Exhibition, and the Ruth Borchard Self-Portrait Prize. Her work has been exhibited and commissioned widely and is held in numerous private and public collections in the UK and internationally. And she's recently contributed to the Portraits for NHS Heroes project. The idea for this portrait came to Halls after she saw Horse in concert and is a true example of a creative partnership and journey between artist and sitter, which has resulted in an abounding legacy. Rather than take on the role of a passive sitter, Horse has said she couldn't picture just sitting there. So they both decided that Horse would sing live and a cappella as part of the sitting in Halls' London studio. She sang her best loved song, Careful, as part of the portrait sitting. And this became an intimate exploration for both of them of Horse's captivating performance style beloved by her fans. This experimental session has resulted in a portrait which rather than depicting one specific pose is an amalgam of all the live move moments, mannerisms and movements Halls witnessed while Horse performed. Halls has said, Horse made these incredible gestures with her hands in particular while she was singing, so I really wanted to try and create some kind of composite image which caught this sense of her being captured mid-performance or mid-note. I've done a few paintings now where I've used a kind of very particular intense colour saturated palette, which is suggestive of neon. It kind of implies that you're no longer something human, but rather you're made of light or time passing, something ephemeral, something beyond yourself. And Horst has talked about her own discovery as part of the journey of the creation of this portrait. She has said, I used to think that that person on the stage that performed to audiences that gave a lot of stuff was not me. Actually, that's my discovery. That is me. I am all those bright colours. It was a privilege to be present when artists and sitter came to view the portrait on display in the Great Hall of the Portrait Gallery in April, fittingly in Lesbian Visibility Week. In the same month, the portrait appeared on the front cover of Diva magazine. And in Halls' own words, once again, in this portrait, she hoped to capture what she had discovered on this journey with Halls, a combination of a fearlessness and charisma with a rare tenderness. I hope that this brief history of the gallery and selection of artworks has whetted your appetite and that at some point in the not too distant future, yeah. Many of you will be able to visit and experience this beautiful building and see the wide range of portraiture on display. So thank you very much. You'll find details to end about the next talk next week. And as it says on the slide, any question about today's talk, please email Flora. Her email address is on the screen at Art UK. And I'm very happy to answer further questions and get back to you with, with the information I've mentioned. Thanks very much for joining me. Take care, everyone. Goodbye.